What I mean by that is uh, he's legitimately a treasure to our denomination. And uh, the other thing I mean by Loki is that he, you're not going to find him on, uh, you know, giant marquees on mega churches or signing autographs at the book table. <laughs> but where you will find him is you'll find him down among the people, loving them, discipling them, caring for them, walking with them, like someone else we know in God's Word. And he's a gift because he knows God's Word, he loves God's Word, and he speaks God's Word. And he's going to speak God's Word to us today. So, give us what you need for us to hear, Pastor Morton. Good morning. If you see me moving gingerly, I had shoulder surgery recently, so anyway. Great greetings from Crown and Joy Presbyterian Church in Richmond, Virginia. Yes. Um, they're worshiping right now, even as we are together here. Um, it's a joy to be here among you again, to see this church continuing to be a witness in this area year in and year out, year in and year out, and for it to be a place for my children and grandchildren to be here. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You can uh, keep us in prayer with an outreach we have to a, uh, a, a youth detention center. Uh, it is uh, one of those places where juveniles are incarcerated for various crimes, these days handling guns. I looked at an 11-year-old boy who has handled a gun and tried to shoot somebody with it. And people yell and scream about young people these days doing this, that, and the other. One of the things we decided to do was get among those young people and present the gospel. So we've teamed up with uh, another ministry and uh, people from our church, our outreach guy, as well as myself, we go there uh, three or four times a month and present the gospel to them. Our crowd is only about six or eight people, but these guys, they listen. They get to be, we get to pray with them. Obviously, their biggest prayer is, can I be released? But we know that as the gospel works in their hearts, they're going to want more than just to be released. So do pray for us in that, in that area. All right, let us open in prayer and begin. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for this opportunity to, to share it. We ask you to prepare our, all of our hearts to hear and also prepare this, let's touch this vessel, be able to deliver it as you would have it delivered. In Jesus' name, amen. One of my young men in my church has taught me how to preach with a tablet, so. <laughs> God is good. We'll be looking this morning at Luke 13, Luke 13, verses 1 through 9. As you can see, the uh, regular mic is not working, so we have to use this thing. So when I start trying to move around, <laughs> God is good. Luke 13, starting at the first verse. Starting at the first verse. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them. 
Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. On August 12th, before the uh, blame game got started, in high gear, and got, I haven't checked yet to see where it, the, the discussion is at this point, but the Washington Post admitted that it was still unclear what ignited the fires on the island of Maui, Hawaii. All they knew was the National Weather Service reported that conditions were ripe for a problem. Months of drought, low humidity, high winds, linked to Hurricane Dora. Fires began on midnight Tuesday, I believe that was August 9th. The magnitude of those fires caught local officials off guard. The first fire burned 675 acres of Macauio. The Lahaina fire started about 11 a.m. that Wednesday under 60 mile an hour winds and did not stop until the historic town was burned to the ground. Fire number three started in Quilla around noon, number four by six on the uh, Peluho Road in Central Valley. Anybody out here speak Hawaiian, you can correct me later. <laughs> there were other fires. At the time, they stated 89 people perished overall. At the time I first began to do my research here, it was well over 100 people that had perished. Bluntly speaking, who sinned? that such a misfortune would happen to them like this. Well, today we will be looking at similar incidents to the one on the island of Maui. People are speculating on why this would happen as Job's friends did centuries ago. But Jesus gave an unexpected answer. Let us see what that was. Now, first, we want to set up the scene here, then explore the incident reports and his response to their speculations. Then, with what does repentance look like? And lastly, point to the parable that Jesus uses to conclude his remarks to this crowd. All right. Now, if you're looking at the book of Luke as a whole, you'll discover that this point in the narrative that Luke has laid out here, uh, that Jew Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. It is some theologians call it the journey to Jerusalem, where he is going to lose his life. But in so doing, nothing in all of creation will ever be the same again. Hallelujah. Luke is capturing now various scenes along the path, and this is one of those scenes along that journey. He is with a large crowd, and his disciples are present. So one group of attendees wanted his commentary on the, in relationship to the situ situations that happened and the reality of sin. Tragedies and sin, how do they connect here? 
The group reports that some Galileans are preparing for and actively engaged in, and or actively engaged in, the usual sacrifices. But there's this garrison of soldiers under the authority of Pilate that attack this group, killing several of its members in such a way that at least symbolically, the blood of the sacrifices were mingled with the blood of the victims. Now, it could have taken place near or within the temple area. The motive for why the soldiers would do this is unclear. Although Galileans were known for being rebellious, and of course you know that would set Roman, off, Roman authorities off. But why did it happen? Why did it happen? Jesus summarizes their intuitive suspicion that somehow they or someone among them had sinned in such a way that it drew the ire of the Almighty and the tragedy ensued. Many would remember the battle of the first battle of Ai in the days of Joshua. There was certainly, that failure certainly was connected to the sin of Achan. Joshua's seventh chapter. Could this be the case here? The question of how, oh, I should say, the question of whose sin was asked regarding the man born blind in John 9, verses 1 through 3. And he went along and he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. So Jesus' comment in today's passage is no different and no less direct and concise. Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all other sinners among the Galileans because they suffered this way? The answer was a resounding no, not at all. I tell you that unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Jesus then reminds them of another incident where 18 Galileans were killed when a tower at Siloam, a reservoir near and for Jerusalem, collapsed on them. Then he, repeats his then he repeats his previous comment. Do you think that they were worse sinners towards God than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? And by extension, do you think something similar has not happened to you because you are less sinners than they are. The answer, once again, is a resounding no. Not at all. I tell you that unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Some of us can almost hear an old-fashioned fire and brimstone preacher with his hands out like this. You're all going to hell, you know. That's, you know, what's going on here? Now, Jesus used these incidents for a teaching moment. He cuts through the questions and the thoughts running through the people's minds and gets to the real issue. He does not do so by answering their question. He does so by answering a different question. Do any of you think you deserve less? Now, in our encounters with God, we bring him our questions. This is a good thing. We should do that. God can handle any question we throw at him. Ask the psalmist. The psalms are full of questions. How long, O Lord, being one of the most well-known? The problem is when we get in our heads of questioning God, 
in a way that calls God into account for what he is doing or is not doing. That's where we get in trouble. Now, why do I get into this issue? Because so many times you hear these stories, particularly as pastors, and my pastor told me that I was not allowed to question God. That's not the problem. The problem is not questioning God. The problem is questioning God. How dare you? We hear this in Psalm 78. When Israel made, it, the, 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 this is a history of how Israel traveled from Exodus into the wilderness and beyond, right? Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. But can he also give bread and provide meat for his people? Yeah. That kind of questioning as Paul said in Romans 9.20. But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will that which is molded say to his molder, what do you think you are making? You know. Now there are times when God, in order to bring us to the place he knows we need to be, will change the question from what we ask to what we should be asking. And those are the ones he answers. Which shows that we're all looking for the wrong answer. It has the feel of looking for love in all the wrong places. Now in this case, of these incidents, the crowd's central question was, what did they do to deserve this? But the follow-up question hiding in the shadows of their mind was, how can I live in such a way that I avoid this kind of tragedy in my life? Is tragedy always a consequence of sin? Now, according to Joe's friends, the answer would be a resounding yes. Their central point in their discussion was about Job's situation was that no such series of calamities take place in someone's life unless there's some grave sin or sins that they have committed or gotten themselves involved in. Eliphaz makes this point in chapters 4 and 5. Bildad makes this point in chapter 8. Zophar makes the point in chapter 11. In chapter 4, for instance, Eliphaz states, as diplomatically as possible, <clears throat> Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the uprights ever destroyed? You, you, you can almost hear this sort of British accent coming out, you know. As one commentator summarized it, our misfortunes result from our misdeeds. Now it is true, and Proverbs teaches this, that there is a connection between a sinful way of life and consequences. Yes, that's there. We have a reason to believe that if you engage in stealing to get money for drugs, that you have a better chance of getting arrested and going to jail than if you're someone who does not steal at all. I mean, you know, percentage raises up if, you, if you're stealing money for drugs. If you spend your teenage years getting by, as we say, getting by, not getting by, getting by, and not putting forth the effort that it takes to complete your homework, to score well on tests, or to get your chores done at home, for crying out loud, there is a good chance you won't be prepared for adulthood. When you realize one day, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm an adult. 
I might be hiding in my mom and daddy's basement, but it just ain't the same as the bunk bed in the bedroom. It just isn't. You know, then getting by doesn't quite work as well as it used to, and you wonder why. So Proverbs is about these general dynamics of cause and effect in life. But this instance is about linking a specific sin to a specific random tragedy in a fallen world, such as the announcement that the 9-11 attacks on September 11, 2001 against the World Trade Center in New York was God judging America for homosexuality. That's what's going on here. Indeed, Ecclesiastes 8.14 states the following. There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. As Dr. Francis Schaeffer was fond of saying, things don't work exactly the way they ought to in a fallen world. So what is Jesus getting at in this dilemma? What is he after again and again? He is after the tendency of men and women, boys and girls, to try to prove that they are good people, that I didn't do it. I, 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 I didn't do it. That they are better than that guy. That they are good enough to not have to repent for this or that sin. Because repentance is for those who are really sinners. Okay? Jesus states that the issue here is not the physical perishing of these Galileans or the residents of Lahaina as being indicators of sin, but rather that unless all of us repent, we will all likewise, just as they did, tragically perish, but perish spiritually. Perish spiritually. The disaster is to die physically unrepentant, no matter how or why we die. It is the certainty of the second death, judgment and hell, that is at issue here. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. So, what does repentance look like? If you get it on the table, and start cutting out. What do you see with repentance? We can get some help from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 87, which asks, what is repentance unto life? Some of you kids out there ought to be able to give the answer. Should I test you? <laughs> The answer is repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of the true sense of his or her sin and apprehension, understanding, of the mercy of God in Christ doth, does, with grief and hatred of his or her sin, turns from it unto God with full purpose of an endeavor after new Obedience. As one commentator put it, there are three C's to repentance. Confession, contrition, and change, which I'm going to say is 
conversion. Confession, contrition, conversion. Confession, we understand and acknowledge that we have committed sin and or are locked in sin patterns in thought, word, deed, and affection. That's the head part. Contrition. We grieve and hate the sin committed or the sin pattern that we are locked into from the heart. Emotion. Affection. That aspect of repentance. And then there's conversion, right? Turn from the sin and or sin pattern to God with a renewed mind to obey and follow God's way in thought, word, deed, and affection. Relying on his grace. Relying on his grace. As we cry out to God, meditate on his word. Crucify the old man. Make no provisions to fulfill the burning desire of the fallen nature of us. Figuratively, Willing to cut off the hand that causes us to stumble, and so forth. That's Matthew 5.30. Now, that's the action part, the hand. So, in repentance, the head, the heart, and the hand come together. They come together to complete the picture of repentance. This is all done understanding the mercy of God in Christ towards us. Without that understanding, we won't come to God, let alone confess with a contrite heart and convert. We'll do the fig, la fig leaves game. Anybody know what the fig leaves thing is? Right? You know how the fig leaves work. You don't want God to see that you've sinned. So you try to find a way to... Did you see that? No, you didn't. No, you, no, you didn't. You did not see that. You know, when you're in a house full of lovely children, and lovely they are, but there are those moments when... No, I didn't. And the cover-up game begins. There's no, don't, uh, you know, the only difference between kids and adults is the kids do it, and it's obvious the adults do it, but we're slick about it. Yeah. You, you, you see the fig leaves, and you think they're just clothes. The fig leaves. <laughs> now, conversion, I mean, repentance is not the same as it's, it's, our, it's our letter cousin, remorse, which scripture calls worldly sorrow. Not the same thing. Second Corinthians 7, 8 through 12. Remorse is, I'm sorry I got caught, arrested, pregnant out of wedlock, or got shot. And you can tell I'm a, I've been an inner city pastor by some of the examples I use. Regret the consequence. Prison. Unprepared for life. Wounded or maybe even killed. Or grieve for the losses. The loss of freedom. The loss of my dream. Or the loss of health. In remorse, we do not ultimately acknowledge that we have sinned. With remorse, we do not ultimately acknowledge that we have sinned. Only that we got caught. That's it. There's no heart change. Behavior modification, maybe. But no change from the heart. The head has not changed. The head is not admitted. The heart has not changed to hate the sin. And their reaction, eh be around for a little while, and then it's back. Because what drives our actions, what's going on between head and heart. The repentancy goes beyond, incidentally, 
just moral infractions committed against a specific commandment. So what I'm about to do here is dig a little bit deeper in relationship to what repentance is. So we're going to go a little deeper here. Repentance goes beyond just moral infractions committed against a specific command, like you lusted somebody else's spouse, or you raged at your child without cause, or you cheated on your tax return. Repentance involves a change of mind, a move from a dark, foolish heart and futile thinking to a heart full of light and the mind of Christ. Huge change here. Huge change here. Now this brings me to the parable that Jesus gave. This group as well. I'm not sure what the fire and brimstone preacher would do with this part. But this is what Jesus did with it, right? God's patience. God's patience. Jesus adds this parable to let us know that God is very patient with us. Thick trees are not the easiest trees to plant, cultivate, and get to produce fruit. It took a few years for that to happen. But eventually it would. Great analogy that Jesus is using here. So when it comes to the place of bearing the fruit of repentance in life, conversion from worshiping the created creature or the creation rather than worshiping let me say that again. A conversion from worshiping the creation, creation or the creature to worshiping the creator, from sin unto righteousness, from foolishness to wisdom. That's the fruit of repentance. To bear, or to bear the fruit of the Spirit is another way to put that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control while renouncing ungodliness and worldly lusts. That process that takes place in our lives often, so often, is like a fig tree. Change does not come easy for us. The good news is God knows that. Now for some people, a certain kind of change and repentance happens much quicker than others. Other areas of our lives may take years. One of the things symbolized by marriage until death do us part is Christ continuing, I'm getting ahead of myself, continuing his good work in our lives until he comes. It's part of that Christ in the church connection. Anybody who's been married over 40 years can tell you, wow, I didn't see that for the first 40. So word for you guys that have been married 20, 25, you got more to learn. <laughs> God is patient. The parable is not describing an argument between the father and the son in the Trinity. There's some, for those of you who are theological types, know that sometimes they pit the father, the angry God, the father who's ready to destroy, and the son pleading with the father, don't do this. The plan of redemption was a joint venture. They were both in on this deal, okay? There's no, you know, one playing off against the other. They were one in their heart. But Jesus is using this as a tool to show us the attitude of both the Father and the Son toward us. 
Now, if you read in the Old Testament, you will see how God will spend hundreds of years cultivating Israel toward righteousness. We see this in Psalms 103, 13 and 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed and remembers that we are dust. He understands how hard this is for us. In fact, when we have nothing but leaves on our lives, he digs up our lives and puts fertilizer on us in a variety of ways to bring us to the point of bearing fruit. John calls this process, John 15, calls this process pruning. Hebrews 12 calls that process discipline. Now, everybody in here knows that fertilizer stinks. Is that right? In Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, you can be riding down 283 somewhere around April and May. And where is that smell coming from? You know, did you cut one? <laughs> Just wind up the windows and turn on the AC. It's the fields. It's the fields. God's pruning has the feel and smell of fertilizer. We don't like it. Oftentimes, those things that God does, the pruning and the discipline, oh man, they hurt, they stink. We call them trials. I was reading Dr. Uh, St. Clair Ferguson's book on sanctification, I believe it's called Doctor of Christian Life, something like that, the title. And he said that the pruning shears of God are sharp. You know, and as he describes the, the blades coming together, <clears throat> you know, and, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the process. See, God loves us so much that rather than just, you know, cut us off and dump us, he dungs it, he fertilizes it. He, he cuts things out of our lives and, 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 and they hurt. But afterwards, as Hebrews calls it, the peaceable fruit of holiness starts to come out of our lives. That's repentance. Now, to cut down in this parable is really points to death. That does not point to some arbitrary point in time where God says, you know what, I'm just sick of you and I am, you know, getting rid. You're just, just cutting you off. No. God has said he will never leave us nor forsake us. One of the, one of the illuminations for me in coming into the Reformed faith was the perseverance of the saints. He perseveres with us. If you're his, he, he's not gonna let you go. He's gonna keep you on the field. Now he might stick you on the sidelines, all right? You went down there and you did the biggest fumble of the game. Whew. You did a foul that knocked the other team's player on the floor. You're going on the sidelines for a little bit. Do you cool down or whatever it is? But you're still on the court. See, he knows how to keep you in the game. Hallelujah. Again, Philippians 1.6. He who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're a hard head, that means you're going to have some losses in life in the midst of all of this. That could have been avoided, like Samson. I remember the day I was reading about Samson and realized what happened. You know what was always getting Samson in trouble? His eyes. 
I saw a Philistine woman. I saw whatever, you know. He was a womanizer, let's just be honest. And how did he get involved in it? His eyes. And what did he lose messing with Delilah? His eyes. But you know what? When Samson bowed over with those two pillars in his hands, because the Philistines didn't know that once he got his hair back, the strength of the spirit would be back on him, he killed more Philistines in his death than in his life. But by that time, he lost the thing that kept Gideon in trouble in the first place. I pray that that does not have to happen to you. But the insurance that's there is that Samson managed to complete the will of God in his life, even though it costs him the loss of his sight to get there. But he got there. Hallelujah. I'm going to conclude at this point with just the following summary points. Do you think you deserve less? You will perish spiritually as surely as they perished physically if you do not repent. Second, the key to escaping spiritual death is repentance. Both at the start of our work, walk with Christ, as well as throughout our Christian life. The key to escaping is repentance. Remember that repentance is confession, contrition, and conversion, not remorse. Confession, contrition, conversion, but not remorse. And lastly, God has great mercy toward us through Christ and patiently cultivates us towards truthfulness because God knows we are but dust. And it's tough for us. He knows that. May I close and putting out the appeal. If you are someone who has not embraced Christ, maybe you're still trying to figure it out. Maybe you're a person who did not believe in God and still wonder if he is out there. Let me tell you, good news, God exists. Better news, God came down and got into what Carl Ellis calls the nasty now and now that he might redeem us to, our, to himself. And that he will walk you through this whole process of change, transforming you into his image day by day, year by year. He's got all the time in the world to do it because he's preparing you for a world beyond this one, for a life beyond this one that will last for eternity. And why did he do all that? Because he loves you. Don't you want to come to know this Jesus? I hope you're saying, yeah. And there are people in this room that would love to talk with you and lead you to this Christ, because he is what's going on for real. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this passage that helps us redirect our attention from, ooh, what happened to them, to where am I with you? I pray all of us, young and old, will continually bring ourselves before you and say, hey, Lord, uh, there's something going on in my life. Point it out. Reveal it. Help me to see so that I might repent and grow in him and you. 
Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not received you as Lord, that they will, even today. today. So I'm ready for this journey. I'm ready to walk with this Savior. I can't, I can't handle it anymore. I can't run my own life anymore. It's a mess, Lord. Come on. And they will begin this wonderful journey of you at work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.